tempted to just read that again. It's so powerful, kind of one of those verses that just kind of preaches itself. But uh, we'll go through that verse by verse, pretty small, uh, pretty short chapter. So we'll go by that verse by verse in a second. But I want to talk about this uh, concept of setting no wicked thing before our eyes. Probably that's something that's quoted a whole lot uh, in, in the, you know, just you can think of the application easily. I mean, and now in the day, television, internet, cell phones in your pocket, I mean, you can easily, you know, think about, I will set no wicked thing before my eye and think about a, a, a way to apply that to your life, no doubt about that. But let me... Let me give you a few things before that. Now, what, anytime I'm talking about standards, okay, standards that we need to set for ourselves, what we're going to choose to do, what we're going to have in our house, what we're going to enforce in our house. You know, I've talked about dress standards, and, uh, and I, I don't know if you remember that message, but I, I went to extremes, okay? Think about somebody, well, how about, you know, how, how covered should I dress, you know, so that I'm not being naked? Well, don't sin, but think about somebody completely naked, right? Put them on that side. That's an extreme, wouldn't you say? Now take somebody over on the other extreme that's like dressed to a T. I'm talking burka and the whole deal. I mean, just completely covered, right? To the sleeves, down to the ankles, on that end. Well, you're going to set your standard somewhere where you don't look like you're heading towards the nakedness side, right? And so you could do that with the whole thing. How long is the long hair? Or how short is short hair on a man? And how you could do these different things. And I remember thinking about this uh, a long time ago. I don't know, maybe I was a teenager and I was thinking about how extremes work. And in fact, when I was tuning my guitar, I noticed that when it's really close to where it's supposed to be, so you're tuning one string to another string and they're really, really close, it's kind of hard to tell, you know, uh, what, where, where it is right exactly. So you'd go to where you know it's bad, right? And you'd play that together, sounds terrible. Maybe go to the other extreme, you know that's bad. And then you say, okay, well, I know it's somewhere in between there. And, and, and then I remember thinking about the same thing with posture. I've never had great posture. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, uh, Braid, uh, Zachary. Zachary always sits up real straight, right? It's, uh, somehow that stuck with him. I've always uh, had pretty bad posture. But I remember thinking, like, I'm going to try to work on my posture. Well, how do I know what's good posture? How do I know when I'm straight? Well, here's real simple. Slouch, right? I know that ain't right. Walking around like I'm slouching. And then stand up, like, almost to where you're, like, too far back, right? That, it's going to be somewhere in between there, right? <laughs> and so and I, in your mind, sometimes you can go to extremes like that, and you can think about where a standard can be. And, uh, man, I think about this in terms of, of what I'm going to, and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm way off. I'm giving you what is supposed to be in the conclusion, okay? So just bear with me. But come on, we understand putting something that's wicked before our eyes. We understand that, that concept. And I'll just jump right into it. Like I said, I was going to kind of work towards this in the conclusion. But let's think about this in terms of what we will, are willing to watch, like on TV or on Internet or something like that. Now, I, we could look at an extreme, extreme negative. Man, I would never, I would never watch that, okay? Let me give you an example. There are a lot of bad things we can put before our eyes. Like, and so let's talk about violence, for instance. I remember, uh, again, back to maybe middle school, uh, they were selling this on, on TV. There was these advertisements for this video. Maybe you've heard of this probably way before anyone's time in here. In fact, you couldn't get it on CD. You had to get it on VHS. Okay? But they were selling this VHS, and it was called Faces of Death. Anybody ever heard of that? Faces of Death. Child's play now, probably, <laughs> since, the, since the Internet's gone where it has and everything. But back then, it's like if you want to watch this, and the only people that wanted to watch this were people that liked watching gory movies where people are murdering each other and dying. And they wanted to watch this, and it was like literal pictures where someone accidentally caught on tape, somebody dying, car falling on them, somebody, you know, and they watched that, and they wanted to watch that. I remember as I'm in middle school thinking, that is just, who in the world would want to put that before their eyes, right? And that's an extreme situation, and we can kind of justify what we put before our, our eyes on TV and say, well, it's definitely not that bad. In fact, these people are just acting, you know, and it's just like, war or it's just like and we can you know we can we can decide where we're going to draw the line for 
for our house, right? But we don't want to go way over there. But it's just, come on, let's think about that. Uh, here's another example. The Bible says not to even look on wine, right, when it is red and it, and it's, and it's turned to itself. Well, we could say, well, like, I'm not even going to look at alcohol. And somebody else will say, well, you know, I don't see where it's a big deal, right? I'm not drinking this stuff. I'm just looking at it. We know that just looking at that could cause you to have an appetite for it, especially if you've ever had a problem with it before. And having that appetite could cause you to want to hang around other people. You know, they're doing it, and next thing you know, you'd be tempted to drink it. So, so look, it's best off to just stay away from it entirely, right? Fornication, you know? We would say, okay, well, there are certain X-rated, you know, whatever. There's no way I would want to look at that, you know? There's so much wickedness that can be seen online. And you're like, well, here's where I would draw my line. I would never want to watch this kind of perversion. But I know that there's some other movies I watch where some of that stuff starts happening a little bit. But come on, I know where to draw the line. I'll close my eyes or something like that, you know. But it's just uh, one step closer, you know, before you know it, you're feeding the appetite of the flesh, okay? So look, in our lives, we're going to have to figure out where to draw the standards. I can't draw it for everybody. Uh, you might have to draw your standards somewhere different than I do for my house, all right? But the, uh, but we are, the, the, the principle is that do we want to have wickedness before you? What is that going to do to you, to, to you and all? And in the context of this psalm, what David is saying when he says, I'm not going to set any wickedness before my eyes, is he's not saying, I mean, they didn't have TVs back then. <laughs> they didn't have the Internet back then. Now, the kings could have called in women dancers to dance in front of them, so I suppose it could be something like that, or you know, who knows what he could be, be talking about. But as you break this down, he's going to tell you exactly what he's talking about. And what he, what he is generally saying is like, I just don't want to allow for any wickedness in my house. I just don't want wickedness in my house. Now, how far are you going to go with that? I mean, you know, again, you got to set a line somewhere when you're drawing standards. What does it mean to have any, you know, you could start getting uh, kind of crazy about this stuff. You could, uh, there's a verse, uh, I didn't write this in my notes, but there's a verse where he says, it's another psalm where he says, like, I wouldn't touch the, their dainties, talking about their food. And I read that a lot, and I, sometimes I read that, and I get convicted about lattes. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, that's like a dainty food, right? Let me just drink black coffee, cheap stuff, right? I don't want to be dainty. Don't ever call me, <laughs> right? And, but what he's talking about are, like, somebody could, like, be sitting before the king's spread of all this wonderful food, and it's like uh, it's like the infomercials where they're trying to get you to to start you know doing their program or their pyramid scheme or whatever. And what they do is they show you this Lamborghini behind them, and this they probably borrowed it from somebody. And they're sitting in front of this big house and the pools and all this, and they're trying to get you to look at that and say, "Oh man, I want that lifestyle." So you'll buy their product. And the idea of of putting that before your face. It could cause you to turn from the Lord and say, you know what? I really want the things of this world. I want to go after those kinds of things. So even food and the appetites of the flesh and stuff like that could be something that would be wicked before our eyes that would cause us to turn away from the Lord. So let's look at what he says here in Psalm 101. Uh, when he says, I will, uh, verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Well, what's turning aside? Right? He wants to serve the Lord. He wants to be godly. And he's saying, I hate the works of those who don't. <laughs> those who, you know, maybe they were going after the Lord and they turned aside because they went after the things of the flesh. We see that in our own lives. We see we've maybe been tempted to do that. We've seen others do that. We certainly see examples of that in the Bible. And we want to be careful that we don't don't do that. And so in the context of what he's saying in this chapter, and I'm going to, I'm going to break it down here in a minute, but he's saying in my house, several times in there, he's talking about this house. He doesn't want there to be any wickedness. I'm laying down the law for my house. And, uh, and this is what we're going to do It's going to be a holy place, a pure place and all that. Now, 
I want to spend a little bit of time on this, but consider what a house was like back then, because houses are a lot different nowadays, all right? <laughs> you know, a lot of single guys in here that live on their own, they've got what by the world standards would actually be a pretty, si pretty decent sized house or apartment or whatever, and they're in it by themselves and all that. Houses weren't quite like that, you know, back in the Bible days. And you could even go back to the Old Testament uh, houses, okay? Obviously, nations and, and kingdoms, if you will, often live in close proximity, right? They, uh, let's go all the way back to the, the children of Israel, and they've got the tabernacle. And wherever that tabernacle is, they would set up camps like right outside that, and they lived kind of as a big community, really, right? Later on, there'd be a temple, and then there'd be like walls around Jerusalem, and the people lived like in the city, like inside the walls, right? This is the community, you know, that was, that was there. And, uh, and oftentimes, that's how people lived. Their houses were in close proximity to each other. Uh, but then, you know, later on, it kind of spread out a little bit. And when you get to the, the New Testament, um, I would go back to David's time here in a minute, but when you get to the New Testament, we see an interesting situation. Look at Acts chapter 8. I'm going to go in chronological order here, but I've got several verses down here to look at. Acts chapter 8. I think this is important for us to understand, and it's going to help in our theology about the church, our eschatology, if you will, and it's going to help in understanding uh, some of these Things making application as we read these. But Acts chapter 8, verse 3. Oops, I went the wrong way. Acts chapter 8, verse 3 says, As for Saul, this is when he's first introduced here, he made a havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, uh, co hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So he went made havoc of the church, right? This is talking about a big community of people. But the way he did it was going from house to house, okay? So all these people made up the church, if you will, okay? In that time. Now, I'm not a universal church person, okay? Oh, we got to look at the time, and we got to figure out what I'm, what I'm fixing to show you. But look ahead to Romans 16.5. Romans 16.5. Paul's writing here, and he says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their, their house. All right, he's, he's just mentioning different people. Here he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. In verse 5 he says, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved uh, Apanitus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. And so he's talking about this, this church that is in somebody's house. Okay, And of course we know uh, about these guys, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and the work that they did for the Lord. And they, they had this house, and he talked about a church, right, or a congregation of believers that was inside his, his house. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 5. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through uh, Macedonia. What am I doing here? Am I right? 1 Corinthians 16, 5. And it may be that I will abide, yea... No, that's not right. What did I do here? I bet you it's 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. Huh? I mean 16. 2 Corinthians 16, 19. No, that's not it. Who cares? Keep going to Colossians. <laughs> Sorry. Colossians chapter 4. I don't know what I missed there. Colossians chapter 4, look at verse 15. It says, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, in Nymphos, and the church which is in his house. Philemon 1, 2. Titus and Philemon, verse 2 there says, He hath in this, uh, let's see here. Philemon 1, verse 2. Man, what did I do? 2, verse 2. No, I'm in Hebrew, sorry. One verse, two, good grief. I got my soul winning Bible, man. I, every time I do this, I'm like, I need to remember next time to bring my regular Bible because I can't read the print. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, 
and to the church in thy house. Okay, so you say, well, so you believe in house churches? Well, I certainly believe you could meet in somebody's house and be a church, right? But even more than that, here's what I think is evident that was going on in those days is that people lived in communities, okay? And so a church, a congregation, they didn't meet every day in the local assembly, right? But in their houses, uh, that's where, you know, they continued as a church throughout the week. They're in these different houses. And in these houses, they had a lot of people. They had a lot of people in these houses, not like so much today. Uh, look, Acts 16. Let's go back to Acts 16. Everybody knows this passage of Scripture. The Philippian jailer. And look at verse 30. Acts 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You're familiar with the background, so I won't labor on it. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. It's so weird that people uh, people stop right there and say, See, if you're saved, I mean, everybody in your house is covered. right? There are actually people that teach that, but if you keep reading, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all them that were in his house. So <laughs> He preached to all of them, right? And he's saying, If all of them will believe that, you know, then they can be saved. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his heart. And when it was, uh, and so, uh, and so, I mean, uh, sorry, believing in God with all his house. I told you about the fine print. So you see there, their houses were often made up of a lot more than what you would think today. In fact, even in those days, if you were poor, you know, nowadays, if you think about having servants, you know, you're thinking, oh, a rich person that has lots of servants. That wasn't the case in those days. Like everybody had servants. A lot of third world countries today, you can go there, and even the poor people, they have servants working for them. And and their their job is pretty much, pay. Their, I mean, their pay is pretty much a place to live and food to eat, right? And they live in there. And that was the case back then. Their houses, they had servants. They had maybe somebody in their family, like a widowed parent. You know, they would take them in, into their house, brothers, sisters, you know, friends who didn't have a home anymore for, you know, because they couldn't afford it or something. Oftentimes there'd be large groups of people meeting together in their house. And it was, they were part of the church. Now, look, this is important. They're not part of the church on Sunday and on Wednesday. See what I mean? Whenever the assembly comes together, they're part of the church every day of the week, right? They were part of the church when they're at home, and, and they didn't just forget, like, you clock in, sit down, hear some preaching, and then you clock out, and then you're not in church anymore. It wasn't like that. They were constantly part of the church. Now, I understand we're the church when we come together and we assemble, right? But they continued to be members of that church and, and, and part of the body when they broke up into their different places. And it wasn't like now you jump in your car and you can drive an hour and a half and go to church. I mean, you know, you either lived in close proximity Or you had a long trip to get to the place where everybody assembles together. And and assembling together was a major ordeal. Okay, But they continued to meet in these houses and and what have you. Now, obviously, in David's time, okay, the king's house was pretty huge. (laughs) Right? The king's house, not to, for one thing, what about all his wives? All of his wives probably had their own little, uh, you know, I was going to say room, but I bet you more than that, kind of like their own little house attached onto the house, I bet. Tons of servants. All of his main captains and leaders of his armies and stuff like that were probably living there, you know, close by. And uh, and he had this, he, 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 he was responsible for a lot of people. And there's no doubt that David is concerned about, you know, hey, this, if, if, if I'm the king, Right. And I'm leading this kingdom. I want to make sure that I'm dealing the people that I'm dealing with in my house are people that are going to uh, be holy and be pure and they're going to be serving the Lord. And I don't want them to uh, to lead to be led astray. Okay, I think of this verse, famous verse, Joshua 24, uh, 15. I'll read it to you. It says, and it uh, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whom land you dwell. 
But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is the mindset David has. He's like, my house is going to serve the Lord. You know, me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. Now, look, most people in here, I'm trying to think how about pretty much everybody has your own place where you live. Even if you're not married, have kids, all that kind of stuff. But you are the head of your house, right? <laughs> you're the head of your house. You're taking care of yourself. There's nobody who you're responsible to or who sets the laws of what goes on in your home, right? You're responsible for doing that. Uh, but in this case, David's like, I'm responsible for everybody who's in this house. Now, I want to sp spend the rest of the message breaking down this chapter. It's a, it's a short chapter. So let's go to Matt, uh, uh, Psalm 101 again. Because this is a verse we hear quoted often, but really this whole psalm is just great. I got on this kick here recently, uh, not kick, but uh, I did the series in Iola that was like psalms, I called it Psalms in Context. And we went through the 13 psalms that have descriptions, like this is when David wrote these psalms. And then we would look at that story that is being referenced in the description. And we would look at that story, then we would read that psalm and go into the context of what he's talking about to make the appropriate application. And, uh, and I love that. That was really nice. And then yesterday, and then, uh, yeah, yesterday in Iola, I stayed in Psalm, even though it wasn't part of the series, I stayed in the book of Psalms and, uh, and we looked at, uh, man, what did we look at? Uh, yeah, Psalm 126. And, and anyway, so I'm just on this, it's like, I can't get out of Psalms. <laughs> the Psalms are, are just wonderful. And I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of going through. So Psalm 101 is, uh, is this one that just kind of jumped out at me, and this is what we're going through. And here's what I want to show you. Okay, number one, number one is this. What's it mean not to set something wicked before my eyes? And we're going to break it all down here in a second. But number one, I want you to understand this. Before you put any, make any standards, this is a regulation or a rule or a standard that I'm going to have for my home, or if you're the only one at your house, for yourself, you know, and this is what I'm going to draw a line. The first, I will say the key, the key is that you have a right heart. You have a right, have a right heart. I mean, you could set, I could set rules for my family, right? And if I don't have a right heart, those rules don't really mean anything to me. I'm going to break them. And if they don't, if my family doesn't have a right heart, I can set rules, but they're going to do everything they can to kind of go around those rules and justify, find loopholes or whatever, because it all starts in the heart. And this is true for Christians, and Jesus drove this home over and over. He said, look, don't just set your bar, hey, I'm not going to kill anybody. <laughs> he says, first half, if you have a right heart, you're not even going to want to be angry with your brother, right? Don't set the bar, I'm not going to commit adultery. If you have a right heart, you're not even you're going to be convicted if you find yourself looking at a woman. You're going to say, "Whoa, if I commit adultery, I mean if I uh, look at a woman in lust after I commit adultery in my heart." It starts with having making sure that the heart is pure and right. Look at verse 1. "I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing." Uh, I love how he says mercy and judgment. Often in the Bible, these two are linked together. You know, Micah 2:8 Micah 6, 8. Micah 6, 8 says, He hath shown thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do, justless, to, do, to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. See how justice and mercy are right there together. You know, and I always think about uh, Joseph. You know, he was a, he was a just man and not, not willing to put it, you know, to make a public example of his wife. You know, he wanted to put her away privily. And so the idea is that, hey, he was, he was a just man. He knew that the law had to be kept, and he knew that he couldn't allow wickedness into his life. Even though he loved Mary, not going to marry her if she was unclean and had committed a fornication. So he wants to put her away, but he has justice, I mean, a, a mercy for her, and he wants to put her away privately so she's not got a bad reputation around. You see that mixed together. Jesus the same way. Jesus very much against sin, wanting to make sure that, that we keep the law and we do right, but then very much also merciful, you know, and, and, and oftentimes those are linked together. If you have a right heart, I believe that, uh, that that will make that'll make sense, right? Loving the Lord your God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself is all about justice and mercy. And having a right heart is essential before deciding what judgments you're going to make or what you're, what rules you're going to enforce in your house. <clears throat> 
Look at verse 2. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Verse, verse uh, yeah, it, then it continues to go on. I will walk, I'm sorry, perfect way. Oh, uh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. You understand the point there is that, hey, I want to have a clean heart before God. That's his first priority. That's the key to anything else that he's going to decide to do is he wants to have a pure heart. And so not, uh, not just a pure heart for the one who's making the rules, but he wants all the people in his house okay, to have a pure heart. Look at verse 6. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, and they that may dwell with, uh, and sorry, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. Look, he didn't even want the servants in his house to be those people that you know weren't living for the Lord, didn't care about the things of the Lord. He wanted even his servants to have a right heart with God. And he's like, I don't even want those guys to come in and be part of my house that are just going to turn away and uh, and 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 to do do wickedness. Okay. So setting the rules and the standards for your house, as I said, it's not necessarily going to give you a right heart just because the standards are there, right? Now, don't get me wrong. If, if you uh, just don't really feel like serving the Lord, you don't feel like your heart's right, or maybe you're the head of your household and you say, look, I don't really, uh, 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 my family doesn't really care, their heart's not right. Look, you still got to have standards. You still got to make the laws and say, well, this is what we're going to do whether we want to or we don't want to do it. This is what we're going to do. But when your heart's right, you know, as a prerequisite to the rules and everything, the guidelines that you're making, everything else is going to fall into place. Okay, so number one is having a right heart. Number two is keeping a right heart. This is, this is what it's about. Okay, this is why you're making the rules. This is why you're saying, I don't want to put these wicked things before my eyes because you want to keep your heart right. <clears throat> keeping your heart right requires removing temptations and influences that are going to change your heart, turn your heart away. Okay, look at verse 4. A forward heart, okay, uh, it's put to me this way before, a to you got toward and you got forward, okay? To and from, basically, okay? Toward and forward. Forward is that person that turns away, like he talked about in verse 1, that person who is going against He's talking against all the good things and the right things. He's going against God, right? Forward. A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Now, it's, it's not that he doesn't know anybody who's wicked. He probably knows all kinds of wicked people. But what he's talking about is, the, the, look, I don't want them in my house. I don't want the temptations there. I don't want to to be best buddies with them and trust them with my life and to, and to have them in my house, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Okay, he's got to get rid of, of certain things. So uh, a forward heart is going to lead to rebellion. Someone clearly has a forward heart, you know, you, you know that eventually they're going to rebel against you. Eventually they're going to cause you to want to rebel because they're forward, and it affects everybody around. Look at verse 5, he says this, all right, these are the people that he doesn't want to know. Whosoever privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart, will not I suffer. So you see right there, he's, he's saying, look, somebody who's a slanderer, slanders against his neighbor, comes in, he's talking, hey, you know, talking about them, you know, about everything that they did, saying things that aren't even true about them probably or whatever. Like, and I'll say this, the slander and the pride kind of go together. And if you read that, he's talking about both of them, right? They're, it's all based in pride. A prideful person does not have a heart that's going to serve the Lord and encourage others. All they want to do is advance themselves. All they want to do is cause strife and all this kind of stuff. And so, uh, so we want to make sure to get rid of any kind of slander, any kind of pride, uh, pride and get rid of that. Verse 7, we want to get rid of liars and deceivers before us verse 7 he that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house he that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight well, look when a person is caught in a lie it's hard to believe anything that they say after that isn't it once they're caught in a lie you're just like how do i know i can trust you now unfortunately 
you get caught in a lie, you know, you still got to move on and you still got to try to get right and prove yourself right after that. But that's a hard situation, you know. I remember early on in our marriage, I had to confess a sin to my wife and I didn't want to do that. But you know what I kept thinking in my mind? Like if I don't confess this sin to her, you know, one day she's going to find out anyway. And if she finds out and I've been deceitful to her, it's going to be a whole lot harder for her to trust me than if I come to her and say, man, I've messed up. I really don't want to do this anymore. And then do you understand what I'm saying? So, so that's a hard thing, to, a hard decision to make. But it comes to saying, look, I don't want to be that person who's caught being deceitful and caught lying, keeping secrets and all that kind of stuff, because that kind of person is going to be hard to trust later on. OK, and so uh, uh, so we want look, these are things that he's saying he wants to get rid of. Look, he's not saying, although this goes without saying, he's not saying, look, I'm not going to hang a picture on my wall of a, of a scantily clad woman. Now, obviously, he's not going to want to do that, but these aren't even the things he's talking about. He says, I'm not going to put any wicked thing before my face. He's talking about people that aren't living righteous and holy. They're not going to be in my house. They're not going to, you know, serve at my table. They're not going to do that. And he says, whoa, man, this is, that's some pretty harsh stuff, right? But this is, what, this is the kind of stuff that he's talking about. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we all have it in us to do all these different things. Pride creeps in. We all have it within us to have a forward heart from time to time or to get lifted up in pride and slander. We all have it in our hearts to sometimes become liars and deceivers. Let's be honest. And let, let me even take it a step further. David wrote this, and it's a wonderful psalm. But let's see, David, have you ever had a forward heart? David, have you ever had slander and pride? Have you ever lied and, and, and been deceitful? Have you ever set anything wicked before your eyes? Like when you went up on the housetop and looked down and watched a woman taking a bath, right? Decided to commit adultery, decided to kill her husband. Look, David wasn't without sin, and none of us are without sin. And so the idea isn't setting some kind of high standard that says, well, we're not going to allow this in our house uh, whether we're talking about the church house or we're talking about our own house or, or whatever we're responsible for. I'm not going to allow this in my house. And just right, putting all these high standards and acting as though we're better than everybody else or something like that, that's not what it's about. What it's about is having a pure heart and saying, I want to have a pure heart. I don't want wicked things in front of my eyes. I don't want to be involved in wickedness and to be part of deceit and gossip. I don't want to be part of slander and all this kind of stuff because you know what? It's going to affect me and it's going to cause me to go away from God. I want to have a holy uh, house. I want to have a, a, a household that's going to encourage me to, to, to be a good leader, a godly leader uh, for the Lord. And again, I mean, this can apply in so many ways. It can apply to, to me as the pastor of the church saying, I want to have a holy church. I don't want any wickedness in this church, right? We already talked about somebody uh, today that might possibly come to church another time, and we'll probably have to take them aside and say, hey, let me ask you a question, <laughs> right? Because we don't want to, this is the danger of going around and saying, hey, I just want to invite you to church. Not necessarily. <laughs> there are people out there that we don't want to come into the church. <gasps> How could you say that? Because it's true. We don't want to just... Uh, now, we want anyone to be able to hear the gospel and have the potential to be saved, but we don't want to just open up the door. Hey, just come as you are and do whatever you want. Continue in sin as long as you're, you know, as long as I can keep preaching to you. No, because it's going to affect everybody. Right now, I'm not... But, but I'm also not setting all these high standards and saying the key is that everybody meets these standards. No, the key is that everyone has a right heart and wants to live for the Lord. And so whenever some of these things start creeping in, we can clean it up and say, hey, we're, gonna, we're not going to do that. You know, we know better than that. We're going to live for the Lord. We're going to do right. So these are the kinds of things that you do as a leader of a church, as the leader of your own household, uh, as the leader of your own house, even if you're the only one there, right? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be very careful what I put in my house. Now, again, I mentioned this at the introduction, but, I have any, but the, the point here isn't even about uh wicked online you know activity uh watching rated r movies or or learning about all the worldly trends and the practices of the day and this is what the world does and 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 maybe we can look here's a true here's a real danger among christians today is that we are in the world and we're of the world 
if we're not careful, right? We're not supposed to be. We're supposed to be in the world and not of the world. Right? But so many people are just like, hey, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And they're just, even the churches are just embracing all these worldly practices and they're embracing all this, uh, these fads of the day and all that. And it's like, whoa, where, where did you get that idea? You know where they got that idea? They're right saturated in the world. They bring it into their house with what they watch on TV. They watch uh, all the shows and they watch all the, uh, you know, the YouTube videos and all that. And they're constantly being learning how to be like the world. David says, I'm not going to do that. You know, I know here's what David wanted to know. I want to meditate on the words of God and I want to know what God says is right and what's wrong. And I want to, as much as lies within me, you know, get rid of all the other wickedness so that I can continue to live for the Lord. But the focus must be first on having that pure heart and wanting things of the Lord, wanting to do right, being convicted whenever you do wrong, you know. And I appreciate guys. I've had guys come up to me and say that they've had struggle with certain temptations and they're taking certain uh, uh, set certain steps to make sure, you know, maybe it's a blocker on the phone or something like that, and certain steps to kind of keep them pure, whatever. Hey, I, we need to do everything we can. But you know what it's going to do? It's going to have to start in the heart. And probably if you're, put, if you're trying to take steps to, to stop doing certain things, that's a pretty good indication that your heart does want to serve the Lord. Okay, But, but it's got to start in the heart or else all the, the, uh, the standards that are set you know, aren't going to mean anything. You're going to break it pretty soon. You're going to find loopholes. You're going to do because your heart wants to do wicked. So the first step is that the heart wouldn't be wicked. And you say, well, I, I don't know. How do I get that? All I can say is pray. Right. If any of you lack wisdom, ask, you know, and so ask God to help you have a pure heart. If you're saved, I mean, he can give you a fleshly heart. He can give you a soft heart, one that's not hardened, and he can do that. And so we need to pray for that. Obviously, continuing to read the Bible and being around other believers who have the right heart and don't want to live in wickedness and allow those kinds of things. They're going to help you. They're going to help you. <sighs> There's no doubt that. Uh, one of the easiest ways and the most subtle ways to allow wickedness into your heart is through TV, you know, uh, Internet, stuff like that. Because, look, when you really think about it, this is what convicts me often because I, lo I like entertainment. I really do. I like to be I like to laugh. I like to uh, to just be entertained. I really do. But the thing is, when we allow the things of the world, you know, we would never. We would never have somebody come into our house, you know, and talk to our kids who are like, you know, uh, professional, uh, man, even a professional athlete really is, you know, the wickedness that a lot of them are involved in. But like, just think about some of these wicked uh, 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 singers and, and bands and stuff like that. We would never have them come into our house, right? But, you know, they get into the house, you know how? On TV. There's music in the background. There's some interview where you're looking at them. And here's what I've done as, and I've, I've really messed up in this and with my children, uh, allowing them to watch too much stuff on TV. And I always thought it's harmless, not really hurting them. In fact, when we watch something, hey, you know, we'll shut it off if it gets too bad or, or if, it, you know, we know that something's coming, hey, you know, delete, I mean, uh, uh, pause that or, or, or mute that or whatever. But, do, you know, there's this appetite being built in my kids or anybody who watches these kind of things and it's slowly creeping into the house things that i would never let in my house but it slowly creeps in and you think oh it's not that bad you know people want to know uh what the trends of the day are so they'll read like uh i don't know what are some of the magazines out there people read uh uh, I don't even know <laughs> the modern uh, things of the day, the gossip of the day and all that kind of stuff, man, even social media, you know, just, you're just all these worldly thoughts and, uh, and all these, these things just start creeping in that you're like, I would never allow that into my house, but we have allowed it into our house and it comes in in such a subtle way. We got to be careful. Okay. So if the heart is right, if you have a pure heart, you want to do things for the Lord, it's going to help you to start setting some standards and say, we're going to have to get some things out of the house, uh, out of, uh, out of the view of those who we have the responsibility over. And, uh, and mainly cause we don't want it. We don't want it to affect our house. Okay. So, uh, it's pretty easy 
nowadays more than ever for, for wickedness to just creep into and come before our eyes, okay? But the head of the house is to set guidelines, and it's a great responsibility for them to do. But truly, like, you can't put it all on, like, let's say, I mean, like I said, most people here, you're kind of the head of your own household, uh, uh, you know, in one way or another. But obviously, kids living under your, your parents' roof or whatever, look, it's their responsibility to set the guidelines. But at the same time, each of us has a responsibility to keep our heart right. Each of us has a responsibility to say, look, I'm going to get that out of my life because it's not going to help me my Christian walk. It's not going to help me serve the Lord. It's going to, it's going to make me to turn away if I'm not careful. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for uh, growing up and having standards in my, uh, in my life. Certainly could have, some things could have been stricter, but Lord, I pray most of all that you'll help everybody in this room right now and anyone listening to the sermon that they would uh, understand that it first starts in our heart. We've got to have a pure heart that wants righteousness and wants to be closer to you. Lord, help us if we have uh, sins that are keeping us back and, and causing us to turn away from you and not have a heart that's right. I pray that you help us confess those sins and get those right and repent of those uh, so that we can begin uh, drawing closer to you. And Lord, as we uh, decide on what good are, are the best standards uh, for this church or, or for our household or whatever, Lord, I pray that you'll, uh, you'll give us wisdom You'll give us boldness and, uh, uh, and strength to do uh, what's right, even whenever it's hard. And I pray, Lord, that you be honored and glorified with our house, uh, houses individually and with the church as a whole, Lord, Iola Baptist Temple. And, and, uh, and I pray, Lord, that you'll just keep us in your word, keep us in prayer, keep us in your will. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.